this week on the Back Table Podcast. And the other is ease of access to the facility itself in that if you have an acute need by the physician actually having ownership in the facility, it's a lot easier to get that patient in. And so if they come in with gangrene or they come in, you know, with with breast pain or, or something like that, I mean, that's something that you can take care of almost that day if you had to. Whereas trying to get that in the hospital, it, it's not going to happen because, you know, in a hospital, you know the shtick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. As outpatient care continues to evolve, Medtronic is ready to help you balance running an office-based lab or ambulatory surgery center while delivering the best patient outcomes. When you partner with Medtronic, you not only have access to its vast product portfolio, but also its business services to help tackle your biggest pain points and meet your goals. Medtronic's experienced team can help you with programs to drive efficiencies, streamline operations, navigate reimbursement changes, and offset the cost of capital. Talk to your Medtronic rep or find information online about the products, services, and support Medtronic offers to help you build or grow your OBL or ASC practice. The website is medtronic.com slash OBL. Now, back to the episode. I got a great episode this week. We're going to be covering building an ASC with Dr. Sean Hislop coming to us from one of my favorite towns, Charleston, South Carolina. And from my other favorite town, Columbus, Ohio, I have a co-host, Krishna Manava, who many of you are probably familiar with. He's been on episode 193 and episode 202. Please check those out. We talked about staffing and OBL and also what was the other one? Basically stocking your shelves, right? Yeah, supply chain. So yeah, definitely check those episodes out. These episodes are all about OBLs and ASCs and helping people get started, where to start, and some of the challenges that you can come across along the way. Sean, thanks for thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I think it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah. So why don't we start with you? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you train and, and where are you at? Tell us a little bit about your practice and the outpatient setting right now. I did all of my training up in New York, in Rochester, New York, at the University of Rochester. And so I was there from 2001 until 2012. So it was a pretty long stint up there of cold weather and, and, and dark nights this time of year, but fantastic training up there. And, and then after I was done with that, which was med school residency fellowship in vascular surgery, I went into the Air Force and in the Air Force, I was down in San Antonio, Texas, which was definitely a change of scenery. And I was there from 2012 until 2016 and had a little stint overseas in Afghanistan as well uh, at Bagram Air Base. After I was done with my commitment in 2016, I came to Charleston and I've been there ever since. Right now, I'm the chief of vascular surgery for one of the hospitals as well. And we're the, the largest vascular surgery group in South Carolina. Right now, we're eight surgeons, varying lengths out of training all the way from, you know, very senior in their 60s, all the way to, you know, having a couple guys here within a few years of being out of training. But we are in Charleston, South Carolina, and we cover the entire coast of South Carolina from all the way up in Myrtle Beach near the North Carolina border, all the way down to Bluffton and Buford, which are right near Savannah. And so we're, we're very busy. We're all over the place. We have eight different offices as well, two major offices, and two of those offices are built out as an OBL. And one of those we are using as an OBL. Right now, we are in the process of building an ASC. That process is nearly complete. We're actually going to be opening our doors coming up here in April. Great. And that's what we're going to be talking about a bit today. Just a quick question. When you joined the group, how has the group increased in size since you joined it? When I joined the group, we were we became five. It, it was three. Okay. The group itself was so busy that we brought on two surgeons right away, kind of a, a middle level guy like myself and then someone fresh out of training. And it's grown to eight. We're actually looking to be ten within within a year. What kinds of cases are you guys doing in the the OBL or office space compared to what you guys are doing in the hospital? The OBL it is pretty restrictive. Pretty much only do angiograms. So we deal with you know lower extremity peripheral arterial disease, venous disease, being you know venograms, venous stents, and then dialysis work as well. Christian, any other questions about his practice? For I was just going to jump into talking a little bit about OBLs versus ASCs. No, it sounds like a really strong, solid, robust practice. I mean, that many vascular surgeons together is amazing. Yeah. So how long ago did the OBLs, did you guys actually start doing cases in the OBLs? 
So the OBL itself actually predates me. It was started by the, the three partners who were there before I came. Okay. And that started in 2013. And the original build out was for three OBL rooms, one in the North Charleston area, and then two down here, kind of near the peninsula, near the city itself. As it turns out, we're really filling one. We probably have capacity to run one and a half. But with the ASC starting up, uh, we're, we're really going to defer a fair amount of stuff, I think, out to the ASC at this point in time. For our audience who's not really familiar or maybe looking into you know, OBL versus AC in terms of building one, can you talk us through the differences and what surgeons or interventionalists can do in each of them? Yeah, I think that it, it really kind of all starts with the way that the, the healthcare system is built. There are really kind of two large buckets of, of pavements. One is for hospital inpatient work which are all covered by the DRG. And so basically you get paid for a, a patient's condition, not necessarily for what you're doing. And, and that's a large percentage of Medicare dollars, healthcare dollars. And then you've got the outpatient realm, which is what we are practicing, which is where ASCs and OBLs live, but also outpatient hospital services as well. And so those are really kind of the three outpatient services that are, are paid and defined by CMS really being outpatient hospital. So it's, and these procedures can be done in any one of these three environments. So outpatient hospital, OBL, and ASC. ASCs and OBLs, there there are significant differences. And, and a lot of those differences are really related to regulation and what can be done and, and what cannot be done. So in an OBL, you, you, you can't bring in anesthesia. The regulations are, are a lot more lenient, but you are also very restricted in the type of cases that you can do. And so the, the outpatient-based labs, or OBL, are really associated with physician offices. And so the acuity really can't be all that high. The type of procedures that can be done in an office-based lab are angiograms predominantly. And really, that's kind of it. I mean, you could do some minor debridements like you would do in the clinic space, but, but certainly nothing major, and you can't use anesthesia services. And there are about 700 OBLs in the country itself. And that's really in comparison to kind of the larger settings, which are hospitals, which are about 6,000, 6,100 hospitals provide outpatient services across the country and almost 6,000, 5,600 or so ASCs that are present around the country. It's really almost an order of magnitude difference in the numbers in that OBLs are significantly less represented in outpatient services. ASCs, generally, they're structured in, a, in two major ways. One is as a single specialty, which is, is what we're building because we do have the critical mass with eight surgeons to completely fill that. And the other option is multi-specialty, where you bring in orthopedics, ENT, plastic surgery, pain. Those tend to be the, the larger centers where you have multiple rooms. And in ambulatory surgical centers, you can pretty much do anything that, that you could do in the hospital with the caveat that it, it's probably something where you don't want to have any risk for significant blood loss. And it's something where you should plan on, if you can, sending the patient home later that day. And so for us, you know, great procedures for that in, in the vascular realm are dialysis access, you know, toe amputations, foot debridements, stuff that wouldn't necessarily require a hospitalization. Thanks for explaining that. I want to go back to what you were saying about bringing in anesthesia. Is it just the level of anesthesia? Because in OBLs in Texas, I know we do moderate sedation and some interventionalists and, and surgeons bring in an anesthesiologist to do the moderate sedation so that they can just focus on the case. Or is that state specific? Probably state specific to a certain extent. You know, we, we have done, we do conscious sedation in our OBL, fentanyl and versed, and we can get patients pretty comfortable, but general anesthetic generally has to go towards the ASC. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's what I was thinking. I just, when you said bring in the anesthesiologist and I thought, well, you wait a second, you know, I know some of them are just will help out and do moderate sedation. I think you, you're right, Sean. So in Ohio, we're super strict. Anything administered through an IV, anything is considered moderate sedation in Ohio. So you have to become an accredited OBL in order to give anything intravenously sedative wise. So I currently don't. I do everything under local or maybe a little oral sedative. But there are other states, I've seen other OBLs where, you know, state specific, they can have anesthesia up to moderate sedation administered by an anesthesiologist or CRNA. So very state specific. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen where they can actually give propofol in the OBL setting in Texas. But, you know, we we're, were talking about Wild West earlier with Florida and the South and Texas definitely falls into that. Well, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about reimbursement, but I do want to touch on it because... 
you know, given there's been re- recent reimbursement cuts, actually over the last few years, right, reimbursement cuts, especially in the PAD space. Can you talk a little bit about OBL versus ASC and maybe why we're seeing more ASCs open up with PAD work given the reimbursement changes recently? We really have seen some significant shifts in reimbursement. The reimbursement itself is really dependent upon what the AMA ROC committee, which kind of helps to develop relative value units and and helps to assist the government with how much they're going to pay for site of service and things like that. And so we have seen recommendation. Of course, CMS doesn't have to take the recommendations of the ROC committee. It's kind of developed in a system where they need to have a good reason as to why they, they don't accept the recommendations of the ROC committee. And the RUC committee itself is, is 32 independent physicians from varying specialties, in addition to about three or 400 other staff members and society at large members who, who submit and help to determine the relative value units. But the trend that we've seen over the last, I mean, really, I mean, since the early 2000s, we've seen some larger trends in that reimbursement has tended to go down for specialists and, and has gone up for non-specialists. So Vascular surgery since 2006 has seen about a 27% decrease in reimbursement for the procedures that they do. Interventional radiology has seen 34%, which is is really the largest, whereas some of the primary care, especially like family practice, has seen a 36% increase in payments for the same services. What has ended up happening is that the, the RUC committee has made recommendations for RVU and for reimbursements based upon site of service. And what we have seen over over really the last, I mean, four or five years, is we've seen a, a pretty significant shift away from the OBL and into the ASC and outpatient hospital facilities. I'm sure that there's you know a variety of reasons behind it, but ultimately what it's resulted in is that one example is if you do an SFA angioplasty and atherectomy, well, since 2018, over the last five years, OBLs have seen a 25% decrease in reimbursement for that. Whereas an ASC or an outpatient hospital, and the reimbursement for those two centers, for whatever reason, actually seems to be tied to one another. And so if if ASC goes up, then the outpatient hospital is going to go up by about the same percentage. And so as opposed to the OBL, where we've seen a 25% decrease in in the ASC and the outpatient hospital, we've seen a 26% increase in payment. And what that has actually done in actual dollar figures is it is, you know, for for cutaneous interventions, it pretty much leveled the playing field between ASC and OBL, because traditionally, at least initially, the OBLs were actually getting paid more money for doing the same service, which may or may not have made a whole lot of sense at the time. But the idea was to encourage a shift to outpatient medicine and lower overall costs and increased efficiency. But what it's done is it's leveled the playing field between ASC and OBL, but it's actually expanded the gap between ASC, OBL, and outpatient hospital-based services. And so really a great example of that is, well, if you're an OBL and ASC and you do a, a FEMPOP atherectomy and stent, the payment for that from CMS generally is is about $1,100, $1,200, whereas for the same exact service, just changing the site of service to the outpatient hospital, that reimbursement is about $17,000. And so the percentage is large in that it's about a 50% increase in cost to the system itself. But even more significantly is the absolute difference because you're talking about large dollar figures. And so the absolute difference is about $6,000 just by doing the same exact thing, but moving it into more of a hospital-based uh, system. And so when you do the math, I mean, if there are, you know, let's say 100,000 of these done a year, well, you know, that, that equates to an awful lot of money when you multiply that times $6,000. And, and so that's kind of what the healthcare system is facing right now. And that's that's what we're seeing as reimbursement trends. And, and so that really has played in to our decision to open up an ASC because we saw this happening a few years ago. And one of my partners actually sits on the Society of Vascular Surgery uh, Political Action Committee. And so he has been involved uh, with trying to interact with, with the RUC committee and with the, the, the House and Senate. And so when you you see, you know, CMS cuts coming through, he's the guy who's on the back end, on our end, who's really, you know, talking to senators. And and so I would bet you that my senator and house members, that their staff has blocked my cell phone number because I am calling all the time. And so that that's, you know, the 10,000 foot view of things. But the reimbursement trends are significant. We are seeing a shift away from OBL. We are seeing a shift to more regulated environment like an ASC or outpatient hospital. And as a result, 
we've needed to diversify so that we can we can give appropriate services to our patients. It's a frustrating game. I mean, so for example, you know, you've had episodes where you've talked about the value of the clinical value of IVIS. Well, IVIS currently in the ASC reimburses zero. You know, we know this is an essential tool to what we do, but it gets nothing in the ASC. So you're deterred from using it because of the cost of the the catheters. And then Shockwave is actually getting reimbursed in the ASC, but not the OBL, right? Right. So it's like you got all these goofy things going on. Again, I didn't want to go too far into the reimbursement stuff. We do have an episode coming out with Jim Melton talking about updates uh, in reimbursement. I'll defer the audience to that to that episode. It should come out in the near future. I do want to move on to so we can talk about building the ASC from the ground up. And I'm literally going to start from the ground, from the dirt. Sean, did you guys buy real estate? Do you recommend buying real estate? Or do you, I mean, I guess it all depends on how much money you got in the bank for those sorts of things. But can you walk us through where you guys started with that? You know, because we are a CON state, we kind of had to start with that because we had to get some idea of of what we were going to be able to do, whether we wanted to be single specially, multi-specially. And so that dictated, you know, where we were going to build this, how large of a footprint we needed and what would all go into the build itself. Ultimately, we decided to be a single specially because we did have the manpower to do that and to fill that space, but you need to know that you're going to fill the space that you built because it, it is very difficult to make these these outpatient centers profitable if you're not filling all the time. In the end, you know that there were a lot of things that played into where we decided to build. Uh, a lot of it was market-based research because we know where our patient populations are. And so, you know, on a monthly basis, we follow where our referrals come from. And so we have a, a really good idea of where our patients are moving. And so in, in Charleston, because living down on the peninsula near the city itself at, in, and near the coastline has gotten very expensive. And so the majority of our patient population, the retirees, are actually shifting to the north of the city, northwest. And so we've identified that. And so when we identified the location that we wanted to build, it was actually, I mean, there, there wasn't a, a ton of building going on at the time. But now, two years down the road, that entire area has exploded. And so I think that we made a, a good choice. But the structure for us is that we decided to build it in an area that was up and coming with a lot of retirees, a lot of retirement communities. And so Del Webb is a big retirement community down here that have, you know, some of them will have multiple 18 hole golf courses and a very well laid out situations. And so we decided to put our ASC right in the middle of that community. And as a result, because it is a planned community, we were not able to buy the land. We actually leased the land from from the development corporation. But the way that we structured it is, is that we have an LLC that owns the building itself, that leases the land from the development corporation. And then we, as a practice, will then lease space from the building owner, which, which is a corporation that's owned by, by us in an LLC. And so it does get pretty intricate, but that was just the best way to do it based upon our legal advice. Uh, and it's the best way to insulate us and, and keep, keep things running. How far is that location from your OBL right now? Probably about 25, 30 minutes. And one of the other considerations is that when you live on the coast, you have to be wary of hurricanes and floods and things like that. And so we did want to make sure that we were pretty far inland, especially if we were investing in this. And we wanted to make sure that the elevation was appropriate. Because, you know, we do have our office where our OBL is located and that is really in the low, lowest of the low country. I mean, we might even be below sea level. And so if we get, get a rain, you know, our back doors are, are flooding and we're having major issues. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't have to deal with that with the large capital investment that we're making. Did you guys as a group go to ASCs or have ownership in any ASCs previously? So when we started the whole process, which was probably honestly... Five years ago, when we started exploring ASC based, and we did have the OBL at the time, we did entertain a couple uh, multi specialty groups, but we just decided at, at the time that it really wasn't right for us. The reimbursement was still pretty good in the OBL, and there wasn't that trend uh, yet, but, but it became very evident over the last few years that, that the trend for reimbursement was shifting to ASC, that the government wanted it in a probably more regulated environment. And as a result, we had to respond to that. But ultimately, with the number of doctors that we have and the number of procedures that we run, when we did the analysis, we could very easily fill an OBL. We're planning on one room now, but we have 
the area sketched out to quickly turn over and build the second room. All, all the lines and all that are already prepared and, and in a common wall. And I'm sure that you'll have more questions about that as we go, but, but I'll leave it right there. Hey, that one room, how'd you outfit that as far as imaging? So the imaging, and we are very used to using C-ARM as, as I'm sure that you are. Uh, we've got a good, you know, 9900 OEM C-ARM with electronic controls and all that type of stuff. And so we are, are very familiar with using that. It, it's very easy to use. And so we had thought about putting in a fixed imaging unit, but the increased capital costs are, are substantial, even financed. And in addition, you know, with the variety of, of procedures that we're doing, we did want to have the ability to kind of move it in and out of the room to provide us extra space in the room itself. And in South Carolina, it, it being a CON state and the fact that they are not allowing coronary interventions at this point in time, there, there was less need for that. I suspect that if and when the CON process changes or goes away or, or cardiac is allowed in the ASC, that, that at that point in time, when we build the second room, that we will pull the trigger and get a fixed imaging unit. How big is the square footage on your ASC? So the, the ASC it, itself right now is a, about 3,500 square feet. The overall building is 8,000 usable square feet. And so we have about 3,500 designated for the ASC and, and 45 hundred that's designated as clinic space. But again, like we, we've already sketched out how we can rapidly add additional space. We're going to start off running four prep and four recovery bays, two of which will be, you know, sealed rooms for isolation for potential overnight stays if needed. In, in the state of South Carolina, patients can stay up to 48 hours before they have to leave. We don't anticipate needing to do that, but if we had to, we wanted to have the option. Ohio has some rules and regs about clinic spaces and surgery centers. I don't know if it's different in South Carolina, but we can't have it in the same suite, essentially. I don't think that there are those rules. In fact, I know that there aren't those rules in the state of South Carolina. But but what I, I do know is that we built it in such a fashion so that they, they truly are separate facilities. There's actually a firewall in between the two. And, and so it, it's pretty squared out in that fashion. The firewall is in such a way that, that it would include any expansion for the ASC side, but that was one of the considerations, and that's why we wanted to have that firewall so that it could truly be defined as separate locations. When you guys were building this, uh, when you're sort of building the business model for it, and you decided on the single specialty, I'm assuming just your group as the only vascular group in it, it's not with other vascular groups, right? Correct. We are really the only vas. We are the only vascular group in the Low Country, and so we have that that market share. There is a, a university based practice, but they don't do any outpatient services at all. What about non physician investors, ownerships, like a consulting firm or a hospital? Let's say, did you guys look at that? We did because it is a, a CON state. You you got kind of one of two ways that you can go about getting the CON. You can, you know, try to team up and, and let the hospitals know in hopes that they won't protest uh, the CON application, uh, or you can just, you know, hope that they don't they don't notice that you're doing it. We took the route of of informing the hospital systems, and in fact, we got letters of recommendation, which definitely helped to expedite the CON process. Uh, not everyone is in that position, but probably a lot of that has to do with that. We are a very busy practice. We are are very large. It's really not going to take away from any of the, the procedures that we're doing at the hospital. And we're expanding so quickly that they just can't manage our volume. And so there had to be an outlet for us. And, and that was just the most reasonable thing. We did approach both the large hospital systems about partnering. Unfortunately, whether the time just wasn't right or what have you. But as you know, the hospitals, they tend to be very slow in their ability to negotiate contracts and all that type of stuff. And each hospital system wanted different percents of ownership and so that really kind of made it so that it wasn't physically possible to do it in that way. There are, are certainly people out there who, you know, right off the rip, look into venture capital, private equity. That wasn't a great option for us because we had all of the resources. We're a pretty efficient practice. And so we have reserves where we could pretty easily fund the center. And so our best option was really just to go to our local banker who we have a great relationship with. They help to fund our OBLs. They know that we're profitable. They're in our books all the time, and, and they actually highly have been, for a long time, highly encouraging that we do something like this. They want us to use capital, they want us to expand, and they want us to provide additional services. And so when people are looking to open an ASC, I, I would tell you 
that having a, a great track record with your local bank and talking to them because they're invested in the community that surrounds us, sitting and talking to your local banker and, and having a great relationship with them is probably going to be the best way to go. Did you guys keep 100% of the equity? We did because we have the, the manpower to fill that. I, I think that really breaks down to how you design it, whether it's single specialty, multi-specialty. Well, if you don't have the cases to fill it, then you got to bring in other people, right? And those other people, in our case, they're, they're not going to be vascular surgeons because there are no other vascular surgery practices in the low country. But in a lot of places, you know, you, it's just, it, it's hard to get the number of patients from a single specialty to fill that facility. And so that's where multi-specialties come in and, and you'll bring in, you know, some orthopedists, but iatrists. And that's, that's the genesis of going to multi-specialty, which we have not had to do. Are you able to give us a little insight on how you divided the ownership or how'd you made that fair? Sure. So we have five partners, five of the eight. And so that kind of made a convenient number, an odd number, which is always nice to have because you don't want stagnation. You know, you can come to impasses with even numbers. And so we have five people. We we used funds, you know, that that would have been directed to our personal accounts to help to start the process itself. And so we each put in equal amounts of money. And so we each have a 20% share. As of right now, all five are, are going to be on the board of directors. All five are going to have voting rights. And then what we anticipate is, as we've kind of gone through the, the process of, of, you know, setting up the corporate structure is that the five of us will each devote a certain percentage of our shares. And so you can just take any number you want, 1%, 5%, what have you. And that'll go into a pot to provide shares for other people to buy in. And so if we want it to, you know, provide private equity or, you know, another surgeon comes into the area or someone who, who practices in the vascular field wants to come in and do cases. The, the CON is not specific to the specialty of the doctor, it's to the procedures that are performed. And so when we applied for the CON, we, we gave a list of procedures that were going to be performed. It doesn't necessarily matter if you're a vascular surgeon who does that for us in the state of South Carolina. You could be, you know, a podiatrist, you could be an interventional radiologist, you could be an inter interventional cardiologist. It's really specific to the procedures that are performed. And so we have those shares set aside for those people to potentially buy in. And, you know, as of right now, we're planning for those to be non-voting shares, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't want to buy in, you know, completely into a, a voting share either, buy out one of the partners, you know, as, as time progresses. Did you use a consulting firm at all or did you guys do this all on your own? So we used a consulting firm for the, the certificate of need process, which is something that I highly recommend because you do not want to reinvent the wheel uh, with that process. We, we did engage a, a couple of, you know, some of the, the national ASC organizations, again, that just wasn't right for us because what they want to do is provide capital and get a share of the ownership, whereas we had the capital and we didn't want to give up ownership. And so that doesn't really work out very well uh, for either involved. And we already knew the process of building things out because we built things before, you know, we built an OBL and we know the revenue cycle, we know the market analysis and and so we were pretty, you know, keyed up on the things on on the MSO side of things that the larger corporations provide, the coding, the billing, administrative services and things like that. And so we're we're pretty ready to go on that stuff. And so really for us it was really just going through the CON process and the design build. We made sure that we engaged builders who had built ASCs before. And so as crazy as it sounds, again, you don't want to reinvent the wheel and so a great example of that is when I was in the military, they built a huge, you know, operating room tower down at, at Brook Armory Medical Center where I was. And it was like 34 or 36 operating rooms, every high tech thing that you could possibly want. But in, in the lowest bidder process for the government, the contract was awarded to someone who had only built hotels before. They had never built a hospital or an operating room or anything like that. And so you can imagine the difficulties that we had with that. And so, you know, we walked in our room and we had, we were going to put in a, a brand new Zego C-arm that's ceiling mounted. And we walk in the room and we find a $2 million ventilation system in the exact spot where the C-arm had to be mounted. Those are the things that you really want to avoid. And, and so if you can find someone who's not going to reinvent the wheel, that, that's what you should do. And that's, we were fortunate to, to do that with our ASA. Along those lines, you guys already talked a little bit about capital equipment, how you decide. And it sounds like you're using C you're gonna you're planning on using C arms because of their portability. Was there any plan or a plan in the future to put a fixed unit in to the ASC? 
as of right now, you know, if and when it becomes time to build that second room, and and a lot is dependent upon whether or not we will be able to, to do coronary procedures as well. And in South Carolina, the CON process, you know, it, it's been threatened that it's going to leave us. Uh, and then last minute, all of a sudden it stays. And so it is kind of up in the air. But, but if we're allowed to bring in interventional cardiology, then absolutely we would put in a, a fixed unit. But with our OBL experience, there, there's very little that we can't do with a really good C-arm. And so it's just not worth it to us right now for that extra capital investment. You know, I mean, you can even get C-arms that can do 3D spins now and, and CT scans and what have you. And so we did look at those as well. But again, you know, it just wasn't a need that it, it fulfilled and the increased price, you know, was just too much for us to stomach. And so we just got your really nice, but still standard 9900 OEM. We did bring in a couple of groups, which I know, Christian, you may want to get to, but we did bring in a couple of groups for imaging and, and additional services that could be offered. And so the imaging packages tend to be tied to the uh, devices and the products that we use. And so kind of the, the two big players in the marketplace are Philips and Medtronic, also Boston Sci. Philips is very unique in that they are truly a one-stop shop in that they, they have the imaging and they have the devices as well. And so they can provide it in a, in a larger package. They also have capital firm and consultation services that help with revenue cycle and all those type of things. But the two other players, Boston Sci and Medtronic, also do partner with, with imaging. Medtronic partners with GE and Boston Science partners with Siemens. And so those, those product lines are, are very similar. Again, they try to make it as much as a one-stop shop as is humanly possible, and they will help you with the financing as well. They'll help you with consulting to say, hey, you know, you need like this type of autoclave and, and these type of booms with lights and all that type of stuff. And, and so it can get very detailed. And, and actually, believe it or not, some of the, the disposable companies have, have gotten into it. And so Henry Schein is also pretty heavily involved in helping not only to, to design and help with the products, but will also assist with capital as well. And so a lot of people are, are putting their fingers in this market marketplace right now. Yeah, we've talked about that previously, right, Krishna, on like one-stop shop versus having choice and options and like you might have in the hospital. Any any opinion on that, Sean, and like sort of the pros and cons of, of one or the other? I do think that it's pretty convenient to work with people that have relationships among the imaging and products that combine together the Boston Science and Medtronic have rebate programs basically where where you get a rebate, you know, based upon how much product you use and, and they can have that rebate applied to the capital costs. And so they can work it so that a check goes basically directly to Siemens or to GE to pay off your capital equipment, or it can go to really anything that you want. It can go to the light company, it can go to the autoclave company, what have you. And, you know, we have been through multiple iterations of this with the OBL. And what we found is the best thing to do with these rebate checks is to actually just have them write you a check for the rebate and then you do with it as you want. Because there may not be a need to make, you know, put that money towards the payment for the C-arm that month. But man, you've got a, a bill from Medtronic or, or Boston Sci that you got to pay that's more pressing. And so as long as you've got a, a good financing department within your organization, it's better, I think, just to, to put that, that money in your own hands and, and figure out where it's best to go. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Krishna, any, anything on that? I was going to ask him a little bit about staffing, but anything on devices? No, we could dive into that for another whole talk, but no, no, I, I'm curious about staffing as well. Yeah. So Sean, I mean, you know, we've talked about this also before on prior episodes is the cost to retain and recruit high quality staff has gotten even worse post COVID. What are the challenges that you guys have had in your group? And do you see challenges in hiring for this AC and then and, and for your growth? You know, I, I think that the advantage of providing just kind of outpatient services that you know it's going to be a scheduled, their shift will be 6.30 at the earliest and at the latest, they'll probably stay until six o'clock at night. And so it just works in very well with, with the way that the nursing staff and techs and medical assistants and PCTs have been scheduled in the hospital setting and that they're used to, you know, 410s or 312s. And so that does work conveniently, but the advantages is that they're not taking call and they're not going to be there late at night, especially the, the radiation techs. I mean, they're used to being called in at two o'clock in the morning for an acute GI bleed or something like that. And as offering only outpatient services, we, we do have the advantage that we can provide a much better quality of life. You do have to be competitive with the salaries. And so again, 
you have to know the market that you're in and you have to keep up to date on that and you have to know how much each hospital system is willing to pay. I do think that one of the major problems in COVID, and we lost multiple staff members to this, even though we live in a fantastic place to live, the money for traveling was was really ridiculous. It was out of control. And so a lot of nurses, you know, could go and make two to three times as much as what they were making for a stable position to travel. And that was a big problem. And it was so large that that in my position, you know, as the department chief at, at our hospital, it became almost impossible to retain staff. And, and the, the numbers that were getting paid out were astronomical to retain staff. But now what we've seen is that, that I think we're over the hump and we're seeing a, a lot of travel companies basically shutting down or offering contracts that are a whole lot more reasonable. We even had a, a traveling company that came to the hospital and said, we are willing to cut our rates just out of the blue. And, and so we are seeing a shift back to normal employment. Again, we are very fortunate in the area that we live and that the, it's really not hard to recruit someone to come to the area. And as long as you run a reasonable organization, you've got a good structure, you're kind to people and, and you show compassion to them and give them a, a good, stable job. It really, for us, it's been pretty easy to recruit. We haven't had a lot of issues and people leave, you know, that's part of business, but, but we can pretty easily fill those spots. We had a whole episode on staffing, so it's near and dear to me, but you know, here in Ohio, we have the same thing, but we are seeing a shift back now to less, less travel. And, and like you said, I mean, when we advertise positions up front, the first thing we talk about is no nights, no weekends, no call, and it gives you an immediate advantage in recruiting and hiring good staff. You know, the, uh, the other thing that's interesting is I love the way you guys are building your ASC very efficiently with a small footprint. You know, the days of ASCs where you hear about these very profitable, you know, great investments. I don't think that's the same in this day and age with declining reimbursements, costs going up, staffing. I don't know for you guys, when you modeled this out, I mean, I'm assuming it's not going to be a huge, huge moneymaker for you all. But, you know, for me, it was the thought of an ASC is efficiency and satisfaction more than it was a financial windfall. What do you think about that? I completely agree. I, I think that if you're expecting for these to be a, a large financial windfall at this point in time, that you're probably misguided. The, the more important reasons to do it are for your patients, for yourselves, for your staff members, for all the people that you employ. The outpatient centers are great because they really, they provide a much better patient experience. If someone goes to the hospital, it might take them 45 minutes to find a parking spot. And when they come to our office, the OBL and, and to the ASC, when it opens, They'll literally have a spot right in front of the front door. You know, our nurses will come out and get them, help them into the wheelchair, bring them in. And, you know, they'll get to know that one person throughout their entire journey through our office. That same person will shepherd them, you know, through the intake, through getting them ready, you know, the prep. And then we'll, we'll take them back in the, you know, when they're done and, and recover them. And patients really value that. It, it gives more of a family feeling. Whereas, you know, I, you go into the hospital and I mean, it's tough. Like you're going to be handed back and forth between 10 different people and you got to be there three hours early. And, and then, you know, you're supposed to go home at a certain time and it doesn't happen, you know, for whatever logistic reason. And so it really becomes a, a monster that patients just don't want to and shouldn't have to deal with. And the other is ease of access to the facility itself. And that if you have an acute need, by the physician actually having ownership in the facility, it's a lot easier to get that patient in. And so if they come in with gangrene or they come in, you know, with, with breast pain or, or something like that, I mean, that's something that you can take care of almost that day if you had to. Whereas trying to get that in the hospital, it, it's not going to happen because, you know, in a hospital, you know the shtick. If quitting time's three o'clock, well, it's two o'clock and, you know, that might as well be five o'clock at night. And, and so that's just not going to happen. And then you get put on the add-on list and and so this patient, this poor patient who's a diabetic and hasn't eaten all day long, you know, their sugars are in the 60s and you're pounding them with glucose just to get them through to this procedure that might happen at 11 o'clock at night. And that's just, that's really bad patient care. And we all know that. And so, you know, we're able to provide really efficient, cost-effective care in a friendly fashion. And that's just, those are the benefits of, of an ASC and of, of owning your own business. 
you know, the orthopedic guys and the ophthalmologists figured this out a long time ago, but I'm hearing more and more that this is the golden era of cardiovascular ASC. So I hope that's true. I think it is. Again, it, it gets into the other 26 states in, in the country allowing for percutaneous coronary interventions. And it does play into the CON. But ultimately, if the same product can be delivered in a more compassionate, a more patient-centered fashion with the same outcomes at lower cost, I mean, there's just no reason that it's not going to go that way. So that's the main reason that, that we decided to invest in these outpatient services. Yeah, it's good for the doctor too. Like all of myself and all of my partners, we go home every day at a reasonable hour and we coach our kids' teams and we're involved in our, our kids' lives. And that, that's important too. I, I mean, it, we can't live in an era where, you know, we are, are tied to a facility that is some big corporation and, and we all feel like doesn't really care about us and doesn't care about our patients. And this is how we get control over our lives and can provide what we believe is the best quality of care to our patients. Someone else isn't taking that decision making from us. And it's that independence, that autonomy that we all want because we know it's best for our patients. When are you guys scheduled to open doors? Right now, the, the scheduled opening date is April 1st. It's probably going to be closer to May 1st. The other thing that I would highly recommend for people who are looking into opening ASCs is, is go visit other ASCs. Take, like, I know you're going to lose productivity, you know, in the one or two days that you're out of your office and out of your OBL and all that stuff, but that can be made up easily. What you can't make up is the idea of reinventing the wheel. And so go see... Oh, ASC is ask your friends, ask your colleagues about theirs, and then go visit them. See what works, see what doesn't work. Because just a discussion over the phone isn't the same. Spending that time to sit down, talk with your, with your colleagues, but most importantly, sit down in that business administrator's office or the facility manager's office and spend some time with them. They're the boots on the ground. They'll tell you what's really going on. Buy them a cup of coffee and buy them lunch and sit down with them. If you invest that time, it, it's really going to pay off in spades. And, and talk to people who have failed ones too, right? And find out what happened because there's, there's some pearls there. It's not just the successes. Well, Sean, this has been a wealth of information. I appreciate you coming on. Christian, any other questions before we finish up? No, Sean, congratulations on your progress so far. And I'm going to take that as an invitation to come down to Charleston and check out your ASC and maybe visit Kiowa, Aaron. There you go. Play some golf. Yeah, we'll get you some shrimp and grits, that's for sure. Well, thanks again, Sean. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Per usual, everybody can find our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Backtable.com. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>